Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you're tuning in. I'm Max Hegblom, Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Microbiology Ecology, and it's my delight to welcome you to this webinar on the environmental dimension of antibiotic resistance. With the global coronavirus pandemic continuing to make traditional conference attendance impossible, FEMS has launched a series of webinars to support the microbiology community during this time. These webinars will provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of key research, enabling the flow of ideas to continue despite the cancellation of in-person events. While Louis Pasteur said the microbes serves, will have the last word. We are trying to put in our viewpoint in between that anyway. FEMS journals are committed to publishing high quality scientific research that is accessible and more easily shared across borders. FEMS journals invest in science. As a non-for-profit organization, FEMS, the Federation of European Microbiological Societies, uses the income from our journals to fund charitable activities and support our community, in particular, early career scientists. We provide grants to hundreds of scientists every year and present several prestigious awards, organize and support conferences, and sponsor a range of events such as this webinar series. If you missed the early webinars, they are available on the FEMS YouTube channel, and I also want to note that we will continue this series in the fall with more topics uh, every month. Today, we focus on the environmental dimension of antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is an increasingly recognized global challenge that is threatening human and animal health, food security, and the global economy. The magnitude and fundamental importance of this challenge has been widely recognized and the effective policies and actions to combat antibiotic resistance depend on better understanding this problem. This includes factors driving the development of antibiotic resistance, such as current antibiotic uses practices in different sectors, the global scope and nature of the problem, and the most effective mitigation and stewardship practices. This webinar is linked to two thematic issues on the topic published in FEMS Microbiology Ecology. The most recent one is just posted this week, and the earlier one is from 2018. So there is much more to explore in the journal. We have three superb speakers today who will provide insights into different aspects of antibiotic resistance. Cornelia Smala from Julius Kuhn Institute in Braunschweig, Germany. Elizabeth Wellington from the School of Life Sciences at the University of Warwick. And Michael Gillings from the Department of Biological Sciences at Macquarie University in Australia. Please note that after the talks, we will open the session for questions and discussion. And so you can submit your questions via the question link, and we will then go through these as far as we have, have time for. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Cornelia Smala from the Julius Kuhn Institute in Braunschweig, Germany, who will talk about antibiotic resistance genes and mobile genetic elements carried by plant-associated bacteria. Connie, the floor is yours. Uh, please unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Okay, so hello everybody. And as mentioned by Max, my title is Antibiotic Resistant Genes and Mobile Genetic Elements Carried by Plant-Associated Bacteria. And I would like to start with uh, a slide introducing antibiotic resistance as an ecological and an environmental phenomenon. And I think there are many recent papers which nicely show the similarities of the plant microbiome and the human microbiome. 
Um, as an introduction, I think it's important to start with the natural or intrinsic resistome as most bacteria out in the environment comprise a set of elements that directly or indirectly contributes to antibiotic resistance. Lack of target, inactivation, low uptake and efflux mechanisms are the main mechanisms which are important here. So the natural or intrinsic resistome has actually not too much to do with the human use of antibiotics or other pollutants. More so, the acquired antibiotic resistant genes and resistome. So this is really very closely linked to human activity and human usage of antibiotics. So antibiotics, metal and biocide compounds used by humans can cause community shifts. That means also naturally resistant bacteria can increase in abundance because they have a selection uh, advantage. But these uh, antibiotics are mainly also fostering horizontal gene transfer processes and horizontally acquired resistances. So the plant microbiome uh, is in quite diverse and we should first start in saying uh, that we do have here uh, a number of different microhabitats, starting with the root, the endorhizosphere, we have the phylosphere, we have the stem, we have the seed microbiome, and so on. In my talk, the focus will be a little bit on the phylosphere, because the phylosphere is very often what we eat. So. Overall, we can say that we have very diverse bacterial communities in the plant microbiome. In the phylosphere, we have an average of 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7 CFU per gram. And the dominant phyla are proteobacteria, or firmicutes, actinobacteria, or bacteroidetes. And not quite surprising, uh, to me at least, is that the composition clearly differs, differs between plant species, cultivars, and depending on the plant developmental stage. And there are a number of external drivers which are important when we want to link the usage of antibiotics for humans or animals organic fertilizer and irrigation water and um, <clears throat> then the plant microbiome. So when we look at the phylosphere, from where do the microbes that colonize the leaves come from? So first of all, they come from the seed microbiome, but they come also from the soil. And that means organic fertilizer quite likely influence the composition of the microbiome. More recently is uh, the realization that dust and rain and also irrigation water quite substantially contribute uh, to the microbiome and the phylosphere. And I also thought that the studies showing that if you grow lettuce in a greenhouse, there are much less microbes colonizing the leaves compared to lettuce grown in field. And more importantly, also the community composition is different, even if you use the same soil and if you use uh, the same uh, seeds or the cultivar. So um, because the microbiome composition is quite closely linked to antibiotic resistant genes and their transferability. I want to briefly introduce also with a few slides the bacterial communities associated to the surface of fresh produce and vegetables. And this uh, slide here comes uh, from data on the one hand from a study by uh, Fira, uh, Lev and Fira from 2013 already. This was based on pirate sequencing. And this shows that, and I just want to point here to this red 
uh, bars, and these are the Enterobacteriaceae. And I was quite astonished to see the relatively high abundance of Enterobacteriaceae, for instance, on sprouts, spinach, or lettuce, or tomato. And the microbiome, for instance, of grapes is quite substantially different. Another study by Janava et al. Uh, from the group of Gabi Berg, they also showed this time based on metagenome sequences of arucula, that Pseudomonas cell, and Enterobacteriaceae were the dominant colonizer in the phylosphere. And using amplicon sequences, uh, sequences with uh, primers targeting only the gamma proteobacteria, they could even show uh, or give more insights into the type of bacteria. From isolation, we already knew that Pantoea, Klebsiella, and Pectobacteria, Acinetobacter, these guys are very typical associated to our leaves. So the phylosphere is actually a quite interesting environment, not very uh, rich in nutrients, but there are spots there are where the nutrients are. And what we can say that they are typically patchy and heterogeneous colonization pattern. They are locally very high cell density. So we have even aggregates and biofilms, and we do have heterogeneous uh, distribution of nutrients and of course microscopy here are some slides from the group of Adam Shikora very nicely show that you have certain areas like uh, uh, the stomata or where that uh, so here we have very nice uh, side roots coming out so there are the microbes <clears throat> so Bacterial traits involved in the adaptation to phylosphere condition. This is something we should talk about when we talk about the resistome of plant-associated bacteria. So many of these isolates that have been sequenced and phenotypically characterized, they are typically producing either antibiotics or biosurfactants. They produce also EPS. They produce quorum sensing signaling molecules and uh, they produce auxins and most importantly they produce a lot of or they have a lot of efflux pumps and these efflux pumps are of course important to survive in this environment so all these equipments are needed for leaf associated bacteria for instance to adapt to the quite harsh and changing conditions on a leaf Plants produce, for instance, also structurally diverse secondary metabolites with antimicrobial activity. And antimicrobial compounds are also produced by neighboring microorganisms. So, as I mentioned already, uh, several of these bacterial names, here the list is a little bit longer. <clears throat> Most of you know these uh, bacteria all belonging to the gamma proteobacteria, mainly to the enterobacteriaceae. But these bacteria that we typically isolate from plants, they are all pretty problematic in the hospital environment. And potential reasons for the success of plant-associated bacteria in medical or clinical settings are, for instance, that Many of these bacteria have the ability to form biofilms, they swarm, uh, they display multiple resistances, often due to efficient efflux pumps. And of course, if you are in an environment where you have loads of antibiotic selective pressure and no competition, they have an enormous selective advantage under hospital conditions. But of course, our plant microbiome uh, might contain also E. coli, but these guys are there at very low numbers, and but they can proliferate at certain conditions. So my long-term research interest was really the acquired resistome of plants. So the transmission of antibiotic-resistant bacteria 
often carrying resistant genes uh, on mobile genetic elements on the one hand goes from organic fertilizer introduced into soil we have airborne dust soil particles flying we know this quite well from northern germany so rain irrigation water all this ends up on our crops and the produce <clears throat> that at the end is eaten by humans so how do bacterial populations respond to organic fertilizer this was a topic we were doing research on for a long time so we saw that we have trends and shifts in the relative abundance of bacterial populations changes in microbe driven functions and we do have uh, an increased abundance and diversity of antibiotic resistant genes and mobile genetic elements conferring antibiotic uh, resistances so what is the impact on the plant microbiome and in particular it's resistant. This morning I read a very nice uh, small opinion paper written by Heribert Hurt, Healthy Soils for Healthy Plants for Healthy Humans. And I like this a lot. So I took, for instance, this uh, citation, since microbes from fruits, salads and vegetables join the human gut microbiome, the plant microbiome can affect the gut microbiome and thereby our human health. Now about the methods. So we are using cultivation dependent and independent methods. For a long time, I was particularly focusing on the cultivation independent methods, so the DNA-based methods. But more recently, I noticed how important it is to play it onto selective media or do enrichments because we can be more sensitive and we can do by genome sequencing a very nice characterization and we can show the linkage of resistant genes. So the tool set is, you can see here, uh, many uh, groups are doing qPCRs, high throughput qPCRs. Also Amplicon sequencing is done a lot, mainly for getting ideas about the community composition. Metagenomics is very much uh, in fashion, uh, it produces huge amount of data. Uh, there is a lot of critical aspects to say, but maybe I, we can postpone this to the discussion. I just want to say here that I believe that functional metagenomics might be uh, very important to be used because just to detect genes where you do not know whether they really confer resistances is unclear. So exogenous capturing of mobile genetic elements, this is another method we are using quite a bit. So something uh, very close to my heart are the microbial hotspots of horizontal gene transfer. So mixing animal and human microbiome this indigenous soil bacteria. This means high cell densities, nutrient availability, and selective pressure. Selective pressure coming from antibiotics, metal, or disinfectant compounds that are introduced via manure or sewage sludge or reused wastewater into soil. But also pesticide contaminated water can obviously uh, foster gene transfer processes because resistant genes might be together on plasmids that also carry degradative genes. Uh, the phylosphere and the rhizosphere offer also hotspots for horizontal gene transfer. Again, we have high cell densities, not everywhere, but we have like here, these hotspots where we have uh, patches of very densely grown microcolonies of bacteria, and um, we have nutrient availability and eventually we also have selective pressure for instance when irrigation water contains micro pollutants so at the end stands and this is a um, topic i never investigated but i would like to but i guess many other groups will do mixing the plant microbiome with the human gut microbiome 
yeah, this means that we have again the situation that we will have a proliferation, maybe also of E. coli, we have nutrient availability, and if, for instance, antibiotics are taken, we have selective pressure. So, transferable resistor. Um, I briefly want to introduce uh, this technique, which is a little old, but uh, it's, I think, very elegant still. So, we are using bacteria from manure, from digestate, from biosolids, treated wastewater, soil or produce. For all these environments, it works very well. We mix them with GFP labeled E. coli or pseudomonas. We let them overnight on filter mating, and then we are plating uh, the resuspended cells on media which contain antibiotics that typically the recipient is sensitive for. But the recipient is labeled with GFP and rifampicin, so we can select for the recipient. And if we use things like this, we can easily capture from all these uh, uh, environments which I or sample types which I mentioned plasmids exogenously. And you can see here that um, we can have on the plasmid that, for instance, integrons, and I'm sure that my Gillings will tell us much more about integrons. That's why I will not spend too much time here. But these integrons are indeed fostering also uh, the, or driving the diversity of plasmids like NP1 plasmids. So some of them we have sequenced, and indeed they all had the integrons, and they carried different resistant genes. Gene cassettes, I should say here, but there were also some that were empty. So they were just ready to receive something which is needed. So in the last part of my presentation, I will focus a little bit on the sampling of the transferable resistome of produce. Originally, this work was started because we wanted to establish uh, primers targeting qPCR systems to detect or quantify ink F and ink I plasmids, uh, which are in contrast to ink P1, narrow host range, but very important in E. coli. So we used an approach, which we I already introduced, DNA-based exogenous capturing and plating, direct or often enrichment. So, and what I didn't say is that we did buy, in this case, cilantro, mixed salad and arugula and shops in Braunschweig and in Magdeburg. And uh, here you see when you plate uh, cilantro, for instance, you get um, quite a number of E. coli that have these resistant genes detected and they have multiple antibiotic resistances as a phenotype. So, when you put lettuce leaves or cilantro leaves overnight in a peptone water at 37, uh, I was personally very surprised because there was not one clone selected in the growth uh, uh, of the cells, but we had like a soup of E. coli and they were pretty diverse. And you can see here that we got quite a diversity of different plasmids and these plasmids this is all only PCR-based detection, so we can still not really pinpoint and link. And if you look at these multiple resistances, some of them also confer or carried blast CTXM genes. And uh, so this was pretty impressive because this is what we eat if we have a nice Chinese uh, dish using fresh cilantro. Luckily, in a collaboration with Stephen Georgievich and Cameron Wright, uh, 120 E. coli were genome their genome was sequenced. We got quite an interesting uh, range of information out of this work. So, for instance, we saw that the dominant phylotype was B1, and that we had different sequence types, uh, which were very abundant. And 84 of our E. coli strains coming from mainly cilantro, but also from mixed salad and arugula, had class one integrons. 
and uh, since the group of Stephen is quite interested in the class one integrants, they investigate or they invested a lot of work to find out more about uh, the linkages. And I thought this was very impressive because here you can see that, of course, IS 26 is around all the time, but it seems to shuffle uh, these integron. Uh, gene cassettes or the adjacent uh, resistant genes a lot. And uh, this is also interesting because we can indicate that we have horizontal transfer here because uh, my mouse is not working or my pointer is not working so well. Anyway, there were N42 uh, uh, strains, for instance, that carried uh, this integron here. So um, we characterized also exogenously captured. So using this technique directly extracting into E. coli. And now we for instance got also in P1 plasmids and these are the very proto strange plasmids and we had numerous ink F plasmids. I, I forgot to say disappointingly uh, Whole genome sequencing using the short reads does not allow you to assemble your plasmids. So um, this slide is uh, a table showing or summarizing the results of looking at the community uh, DNA, which we extracted from mixed salad, arugula, and cilantro. And you can see here something quite interesting. We have nothing detected, no ink F plasmids in most of our produce. Um, also, we had isolates and also we exogenously captured. If we do an overnight enrichment, we can detect them. So this is for me an important message because it shows that our DNA based methods will not always be very sensitive. So I want to conclude and uh, talk a bit about implication for food safety here. So via organic fertilizer and irrigation water, bacteria carrying plasmid localized ARGs are introduced together with pollutants into our agro ecosystem. There's no question about this. Mobile genetic elements such as plasmids, they seem to be key for the red rapid adaptation of our bacterial host to these pollutants and the rare microbiome of plants, for instance, E. coli, uh, that carries transferable resistant genes might proliferate under selective conditions and transfer resistances to the human gut microbiota. So, from our work here, we conclude that the di direct DNA-based methods are often not sensitive enough to detect ARGs and MGEs, so resistant genes and mobile genetic elements, present in the rare microbiome, and they are not suitable to determine whether there's gene transferability or whether the genetic context uh, or how the genetic context is, at least as long as we are using only short reads. So, but we would really propose that the transferable resistome of produce might be a major link between the environment and humans. And last but not least, I want to show a cartoon taken from this review of Heri. And uh, I thought it is really important to show the, the importance, or this is important that we look at this healthy plant microbiome. And for me, one aspect of a healthy plant microbiome is also the occurrence of transferable antibiotic resistances. So, uh, in order to achieve this, we should consider uh, all these entry passes that contribute to the transferable resistome of the phylosphere. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk. I just briefly want to show a few phases. Uh, I do not have 
uh, photos here, for instance, from uh, from Stephen Georgievich and Cameron, but at least a few people are mentioned here. So with that, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Connie. Uh, very interesting, and I have, will have to take a new look at my vegetables. I like to eat vegetables. <laughs> yes. So thank you. We will travel from Braunschweig to uh, Coventry, where Elizabeth Wellington from the School of Life Sciences, University of Warwick, is our next speaker. And she's going to talk about recycling genes and genomes and their impacts on sewage treatment processes and the environmental of the system. So, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, uh, hello, everyone. Um, in contrast now from that superb presentation just given by Connie Smala, we're going to move from the oral route, that's the consumption of produce, to the anal route, which is the other end of things. And of course, I'm talking about sewage. And really, probably for too many years now, I have been interested in sewage treatment and recycling and how the microbiology of this interesting resource impacts on our environment. And so I'm going to give you a little mini overview of a, a project we've been doing on the rivers um, in the middle of England, which is where I'm located, and the focus is on the Thames. But first, I need to give you some context, really, of what we're up to. So we need to think about rivers. We need to think in the context of the whole resistome that's just been discussed, which is the importance of the environment as a as a source of resistance genes, but also as a means of generating new genes. And rivers are, are vitally important in our ecosystem, but they are also conduits of waste. They're used for waste disposal. They're sites for recreation, really important. They supply irrigation to farmland, as, as we've heard from Connie, and of course, they're important resources for wildlife. So probably over 20 years ago, we started to become interested in the relationship between the biocides used in hospitals and in the home and the impact on drug resistance. So already for many years, clinical scientists had shown there was a direct link between efflux pumps and antibiotic resistance. So you, you really see that relationship as beautifully uh, shown by, by Connie in those class one integrons. The quacky is an efflux pump for quaternary ammonium compounds, and then you have your little assorted antibiotic resistance. And of course, sewage effluent contains very high levels of surfactants. So these will be things like uh, biocides used in household waste, shampoos, water softeners, all of those kinds of things, many of which contain quaternary ammonium compounds. So we have a, a, a double-edged problem. So as Connie pointed out, we have heavy metals, we have other pollutants, but we also have these biocides, which are all combined together in our rivers. One of the early work that we did showed that sewage sludge, if you look here, um, sewage sludge used had very high levels of genes involved in export out of the cell of quaternary ammonium compounds, the quack genes. And you can see that that was in contrast to a pristine soil, uh, but there was also an elevated level in a reed bed, which was handling waste from a textile mill. And again, when we studied the um, application to land of waste, this is uh, pig slurry in this case, you see that you get an elevation of 
class one integrons and this quacky delta one this is associated with the class one integron so it's the integrase relationship so that that's been really a, an intriguing relationship that that is that is now played out continually under selection for me during those years one of the most insightful results was that we noticed the ingression of resistance genes into indigenous soil bacteria and, and this is really important because we don't know what impact that has on the ecosystem and this is something that we do need to consider so you can see here that we have an arthrobacter which has a typical class one integrons and the levels of resistance to sorry the levels of similarity to resistance genes in human associated bacteria is very high so it's virtually identical to a class one integron you might find in e coli or salmonella in a human associated organism so we're seeing a, a, a mobility of genes that are involved in efflux that are involved in resistance and in particular sub one is an intriguing one because again we see this relationship there's a conserved integron relationship between that the quack a resistance gene and the integrase and we'll hear about that from michael Gillings, the evolution of these elements so following on from that work we were able to established from studying rivers that wastewater treatment plants could disseminate antibiotic resistance but they would they would also disseminate mobile elements and resistant bacteria because there they got contents uh, feces is 99 percent got bacteria but really that didn't tell us where those bacteria were going were they persisting were they surviving and where did the genes go? Did the genes go into other bacteria, as we saw in the case in the soil? Or did we see evidence that they died away and there was no impact? So that really enabled us to ask a number of questions of, again, the Thames catchment, very important river in the UK. But actually, the, one of the key things is that you don't need whoops, you don't need a, a multi-million pound study to prove that there are problems with wastewater treatment systems. You only need to use your eyes and nose to see what's going on in some of our rivers. So there's a really serious problem here, and many fines have been given out by the Environment Agency when these kinds of dramatic sewage leaks happen in our rivers. And this is something that's troubled me for several years because it's combined with the privatization of our water utility industry and enormous payouts that the uh, CEOs of these organizations receive. I don't want to get too much in detail there because it gets really uh, upsetting. But we could say that, say, one of our biggest water uh, utility companies, Southern Water, has uh, a, a fine of outstanding of 126 million for a whole series of leaks and loss of water and so on. So, so really important now in the era of a pandemic that we are polluting our environment with our waste. Now, this is a global problem. So we were very lucky in our study to work with some excellent scientists under the um, leadership of Chang Jong Cha in CAU in South Korea in Seoul. And they undertook a parallel investigation of the River Han and we were doing the Thames work and they were, they'd initiated their study on the River Han. And what was interesting is that the River Han starts in a pristine upland environment and then it goes downstream into the city of Seoul, which, which is a huge uh, conurbation 
and it's a megatropolis, so it's a, it's a very large, over, well over 20 million people. And what, what you can see, this is published in um, Microbiome, and it, it shows very nicely the relationship between anthropogenic inputs and the prevalence of antibiotic resistance genes, ARG, the density. And you, you can see that in this figure here. But what is really interesting, and I think impressive in this study, is that um, they found very similar results to our own, but more than that, they showed in great detail how genes were being mobilized from human associated bacteria into indigenous environmental bacteria on a very big scale. So you were seeing a correlation between anthropogenic activities. So for example, wastewater treatment plants, nitrogen input, that's the sewage and uh, wastewater treatment capacity. But it wasn't just that you were seeing a correlation between what's coming out of wastewater treatment plants, but you were also seeing a correlation between the, the change of the prevalence of genes involved in resistance in their background of bacteria that are not human associated. So that's a that's a, for me that was a very important observation. I would definitely recommend looking at that paper. So if we go back to the Thames catchment, give you a quick overview of how we went about the study and just some just smatterings of, of results. So sample sites are shown across the catchment. London, you can see, is is on the uh, right side. Is here. This is London. Obviously, it's excluded because it's um. So conurbation. And then we have all of our wastewater treatment plants, fish farms, but also one thing to remember, a huge number of septic tanks. Septic tanks are tanks that are not necessarily connected to the sewage treatment. They soak away and a lot of the contents will end up in the river. So it's, it's a kind of unknown impact. And this is something that we also wanted to investigate, is whether these were having an impact, specifically in rural areas. So an important thing to consider then in our sample sites and our wastewater treatment plants was in each tributary, what was going on, what land use was occurring, how were um, the uh, septic tanks and the wastewater treatment plants located. And we had to, evaluate the impact of these on the sample site. So we had to get an estimate of distance from our GIS measurements and we used our um, GIS. So uh, we used a, a remote sensing uh, data that was um, provided by um, collaborators at the um, uh, Centre for Hydrology in uh, Wallingford. So, so here we can see in the in the boxed areas some of the key tributaries. So we've got tributaries analysed, and then we've also got the analysis that we did. So, in addition to quantitative PCR, which we did for a number of of targeted genes, we did a, a detailed metagenome analysis from those sites. So if you look at the um, at the green sites, we did metagenome. At the red sites, we did um, metagenome. Uh, we, did, we didn't do metagenome, we did qPCR, and all of sites had, had qPCR done. So we were able to then put together the information about what was going on in each of our tributaries. And there was a very strong relationship between the total amount of resistance. So this is, is not necessarily human associated, but it, it is just total resistance genes, according to card database and so on, and the um, different tributaries. So there was a really strong impact of where the tributaries were. 
what we also noted was that there was a difference between the tributaries and the uh, amount of um, urban suburban. So we had woodland, arable, pasture, urban suburban. And obviously, the tame, the ray, and the cart were three areas that had um, very high level of urban development around the sample sites where you were sampling. And if you remember those three, the tame, the cut, and the ray, we see a pattern emerging from the chemical data that we looked at. So looking at antibiotics in the river, we're actually seeing in the, the cut, the ray, and the tame quite a lot of antibiotics. So there, there, and there. And then you see it again there, there, and there, and so on. And also, I don't share the data, but a lot of um, indicators like caffeine, carbamazepine, the sort of antidepressants kind of drugs, as well as antibiotics. Some antibiotics, I was very interested in the sulfonamides, were um, showing this, a similar kind of pattern from the ray and the tame, but they were less, there was less agreement with sulfonamides compared to say, for example, trimethoprim, which fitted the standard for most of the other antibiotics, the cut, the ray, and the tame here. So we can already see that there is a, uh, there's a big impact of uh, wastewater treatment plants related to the uh, urban development. So these would be plants with high uh, handling capacity uh, of course, they would be more sophisticated in their treatment of the waste, but we have the issue about uncontrolled raw sewage release, which is something that I think happens much more often than uh, water utility companies admit to. And this is one of the main problems. So if we consider the seasonal impact, we see also a significant difference. And if we look at two resistances, the uh, SME resistance, SOL1, SOL2, and trimethoprine resistance, DFR, um, and B and E genes, and the integron, then we see uh, usually um, a greater, for the SOL1 at least, a greater prevalence uh, in the winter than the summer. But it's not significant, really for others and the opposite trend was seen for DFR. So there's different patterns occurring and we see that also when we compare the um, different genes across the, the four highest uh, trimethoprine um, sites and the four lowest trimethoprine sites. So in, intriguingly, that the gene that corresponded and correlated the best with trimethoprim levels was the SOL1 gene. And you can see that at the low trimethoprim sites, we saw equal or similar levels of DFR. So there's an interesting picture emerging. Um, but overall, if we consider um, the qPCR data, a clear pattern was produced, which was that the cut, the ray, and the tame always provided us with significantly higher levels of resistance genes that fitted the classical human-associated clinically important genes. So this is clear evidence of association with, with human uh, fecal contamination, I would suggest. In previous publications, we had developed a relationship between the um, population equivalent capacity of a wastewater treatment plant and the distance of the sample site from that plant. And of course, you can see here that that is still a significant relationship using the AMOS model. This was a postdoc with me, Greg Amos, and um, that still holds true for the data. And this is the data on the qPCR. It also held true for the metagenomic data. So that over 50% of the variation was attributed to 
the relationship with distance from wastewater treatment plant. But it was more subtle than that in the study that we we just finished in that it mattered. So if we're looking at the R squares here, it mattered whether or not we had in there the urban suburban. So we are seeing that um, we're getting the best relationship with combination of, um, it's a negative relationship with arable and a positive relationship with urban suburban. So you can see here that if you if you just look at distance from wastewater treatment plant, the season is quite low. But when you combine that with urban suburban, then the relationship, the R squared, is more significant. So this is telling us that that the wastewater treatment plants, even though the PE might be equivalent, it's the ones in the urban, the very highly urban and suburban areas that are the most detrimental. Um, to spreading uh, antibiotic resistance genes. And if we look at the relationship with the human associated bacteroides, we can see in this volcano plot that we have a very clear true relationship. And that the highest level is cell one again, that's a really nice indicator um, of anthropogenic inputs. We have efflux pumps, and then we have the macrolide resistance, the other um, multidrug efflux, and then the aminoglycoside tetracycline. So that is data all coming from the metagenome that is supporting um, other studies and other data. So trimetoprin is, is an antibiotic that's still used for urinary tract infections. It's highly stable. It persists in the environment. It's not really readily degraded. You find it in sediments as well as planktonic water in rivers. And we saw a very strong correlation between sulfonamide resistance and trimethoprim. And in fact, the sulfonamide genes that we were finding were identical to the gene that we found in Arthrobacter in 2011. This gene is probably identical to the one that Connie has just talked about. And it, it seems to be the most mobile resistance gene on Earth. It's a staggeringly mobile gene. And in the Han River, it's ingressed into alongside other genes into indigenous bacteria. And it has done the same in, in our system, as I'll show in a minute. But what is nice, I think, here is that we're still seeing integron nicely correlating with cell one in our whole genome data there. This is correlogram. And that we also see a whole block of resistance here correlating with drugs. So it's a, it's a correlation. We're not saying it's a causation, but what we are pointing to is that the mobilization of genes, probably in the human gut and in the clinic, is contributing to the dissemination of these genes in the environment. And it may have something to do with selection, but that is extremely difficult to, to prove. And we, we're still trying to study that. But what's absolutely clear is that these clinically important human associated genes are mobilized. And that's why they move and they ingress. So here we've got the sequences. There's the SOM1 that we found and some of the efflux is integral associated in this assembly graph and it's plasmid associated as well. And then if we drill down further into the contigs that we recovered from the metagenome, we find that it is gram negatives that is associated with, and we find very similar results to that done in, in discovered in the Han River from there. They've used very different uh, approach to us, but came up with the same results that pseudomonads, sphingomonas, and Enterobacteriaceae and many of the proteobacteria had these genes and these genes had egressed. And these were river associated genes. These were not the genomes. These were river associated genomes. These were not human associated. And that's also very clear in the Han River. So to, to then uh, kind of 
consider something up, in, uh, we have clear evidence that um, resistance is a, is a biohazard. So we have both viable uh, resistant bacteria in the Thames. We know that because we could isolate them at any time, but we also have significant clinically important resistance, both in viable human associated bacteria and in indigenous uh, bacteria. The SOL1 and the efflux genes, MDR, uh, contained in plasmids and integrons, these are really associated with antibiotic pollution. So one is a hugely mobile gene and it carries other genes with it. We're still seeing the main offending uh, activity is wastewater treatment, but that urban land is also driving up large. So we are seeing some input from that. There's probably um, metals and uh, chemicals there. And so what we have done in our in our model system is use a, a mechanism of predicting the most troublesome wastewater treatment plants and what might be done to alleviate the contamination. So these are the markers. And then the key things I think to take home are mobilization of our into indigenous communities and also that non-human associated antibiotic resistance is very prevalent in in uh, various reservoirs and we found the flavor bacteriales uh, had, a, had a high level and these are always chromosomal associated but not mg associated okay i'd like to finish by by thanking some of the key people involved so um Jenny Holden and Li Hong Zhang, Uli Klupa, and uh, members of some of the members of my group who are actually uh, listed here. So this was part of a very big project, and Will Gaze was a very important um, collaborator in the University of Exeter, Andrew Singer at CEH. We were very lucky to work with Steve Jordovich in Australia, who helped us work out human and non-human associated E. coli and Chang Jung Cha and his group in CAU. And then of course, Greg, uh, Li Hong, Kathy and, and Gemma, and Peter Hawkey, who's a clinical consultant, and Andrew Mead, who did some of the statistical analysis. And finally, but absolutely most important was the bioinformatic analysis done by Chris Quint and Seb Beguido and Li Hong Zhang for some of the chemistry. Thanks for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we will quickly move on and now actually take a very long journey to Australia, Sydney, where uh, Michael Gillings has graciously stayed up or actually starting tomorrow very early for him. He will talk about the assembly of complex resistance elements inside the human gut. Michael, you're still there. Thank you. So you should make sure you're unmuted and uh, you have the floor. As if for some reason, oh, I'm unmuted now. Yes, now you're good. So let me just check, Michael, for some reason you are muted. Okay, you should be able to hear me now. Yes. Is that right? Yes, okay. we're good. And I can, I can see my screen loading, but it doesn't actually flick into... Okay, no, you're, you're fine. Actually, we see your presentation, so we should be okay. good. All right, I can only, I can't see my screen myself though, which is a bit of a problem. So hold on. Um, <laughs> I assure everyone that we did this before and it was perfect. Okay, so are we good now? Uh, yes. Good, okay. So um, thank you very much for uh, 
inviting me to talk uh, and I'm going to talk quite a lot about things that you've already heard from uh, Connie and Liz. So it shouldn't um, come as a surprise to any of you that humans are now the largest evolutionary force on the planet and that we um, have we have um, put selection pressure on every other organism on the planet. We sometimes do this directly, we sometimes do it accidentally. And one of the clearest examples of this evolutionary pressure is antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And my interest is, I want to understand the origins of this resistance, because if we can understand where resistance comes from and how it appears, then we have a chance of stopping additional resistance elements and stopping new forms of bacterial adaptation to human attempts to control bacterial growth. So, um, resistance of course appears quickly and it seems to be inevitable. It's often less than a decade after the introduction of an antibiotic that we see the first resistance to that antibiotic. And this acquisition is driven by two main processes. The first is mutation. That is mutations to uh, genes that encode antibiotic targets. And the other is lateral transfer. Now, from my perspective, mutation, there's not much you can do about. Mutation happens at a set rate and we can't really, well, we can slightly ramp up mutation rates or ramp them down, but it's not very controllable. So I've been much more interested in lateral gene transfer because there's the potential that we can do something about lateral transfer. And it's important because it confers immediate changes to phenotype and it can spread those resistance phenotypes or indeed other phenotypes between different species of bacteria. So now I want to introduce something that you've heard quite a lot about already and that is the integrons because this is a really good example of human driven selection of mobile DNA. So integrons are mo mobile are genetic elements. They're found in bacteria. They're actually quite common. They're found in about 15% of bacterial chromosomes. And what they do is they acquire novel genes from the metagenome. They sample genes from the environment. They plug them in, they play them, and they test them out. And um, the reason why integrons are kept coming up again and again is that one particular member of this family, which is a very diverse family of genetic elements, it's called the class one integron because it was the first one to be discovered, it's spread resistance to virtually all gram negative pathogens. But it's important to step back and think about what integrons actually do or what they did and continue to do over the hundreds and hundreds of millions of years that they've been operating in bacterial genomes. So they work like this. Here's an integron. Uh, we've got the, in, the integrase gene itself and a series of gene cassettes that it's captured. And as long as the environment remains stable, this integron is not really going to do anything. It will just express these gene cassettes and it'll be quite happy. As soon as you get an environmental perturbation, it triggers integron recombination. So that environmental perturbation can be all sorts of things. It can be a change in pH, a temperature shock, a change in salinity, some kind of toxin, a heavy metal. There's all sorts of things that can induce this. It's called the SOS response. So an environmental stressor triggers the SRS response that stimulates integron recombination and this otherwise stable element here starts to recombine, reorder the gene cassettes and acquire new gene cassettes from the environment. And what this does, it generates a population of genetically diverse cells upon which selection can act. So this is the equivalent, if you like, of bacterial sex. 
Now, some gene cassettes can actually confer resistance to antibiotics. So think about what is going to happen when you take a bacterial community that contains integrons and you show them antibiotics. The antibiotics are going to trigger the SOS response. That is going to activate integron activity. The integrons are then going to sample diverse genes from the environment and the antibiotics are sitting there waiting to impose selection pressure on the one or two integrons that happen to have accidentally acquired the right antibiotic resistance gene cassettes. So what that means is that integrons were exquisitely pre-adapted to be a problem for human control of bacterial growth by antibiotics. They were poised there waiting to be difficult for us. So the problem though is that most integrons are chromosomal and so when you're chromosomal the only lineage that can be resistant by acquiring a resistance cassette is the one that the integron is resting in. In order to to spread resistance rapidly, the integron platform needs to be mobile. So for a long time, um, my colleague Hatch Stokes and I and my laboratory have been interested in how this class one integron became mobile. And it, gradually over the years, we've pieced this together. And it's actually a very complex mosaic assembly. And it involved transposons and resistance genes. And from looking at the DNA sequences that are involved here, it looks as though it probably only ever occurred once and in a single cell. So what we've got are diverse chromosomal class one integrons with sequence diversity, exposed to a whole series of mobile elements and also integron gene cassettes. The chromosomal one of these chromosomal class one integrons was captured by a transposon. That transposon itself inserted into another transposon that encoded mercury, and you end up with this complex element here. And this is the thing that we think formed once in a single cell at one point in time. So this is what it looks like. We can still recover this from environmental samples. And here's where we go to some of Connie's um, talk. It turns out it's on an ink P plasmid. That ink P plasmid we recovered from a plant associated strain of Enterobacter cloacae. We know that because we've genome sequenced it and Enterobacter cloacae, there are strains that prefer to live on plants. Um, the, um, we recovered it from uh, spinach, and so without breaking any of the rules of plasmid nomenclature, we managed to call this Popeye uh, plasmid, uh, which you know snuck past all of the reviewers, so now it's permanent. Now, if we look at this, what you've got is the integron integrase gene that does the recombination. It's got a cassette, which is an NADPH-dependent flavin mononucleotide reductase. It's got a quark efflux pump that you have heard about, and it's also got a mercury resistance operon. And these three elements are of particular interest because they correspond to the three first antimicrobial compounds that were, were widely used before the invention of sulfonamide antibiotics. So the NADPH dependent blah, 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 repairs the oxidative damage caused by arsenic. Quark E is an efflux pump that pumps benzylconium chloride um, out of, and other quaternary, quaternary ammonium compounds out of cells. Uh, that's the main ingredient in lysol. And down here, we've got the mercury uh, resistance operon, the mer operon. So this to me suggests that what happened is that like Connie was suggesting, we eat leafy vegetables. That leafy vegetable has an enterobacter cloacae with the um, POP1 plasmid. 
once the enterobacter gets into the commensal flora in the gut, it conjugates the plasmid across into commensal E. cloacae in the human gut. And then the fixation of that transconjugant is driven by exposure to the early microbial agents uh, that were present in the 1930s or so. Okay, so then this original element, which as I said before, we think happened once because this particular chunk here is pretty much 100% identical in all extant clinical class one integrons. This is now a really interesting element in the gut of humans, and now it has the ability to acquire diverse resistance gene cassettes to spread onto diverse plasmids and transposons and to move between lots of different bacterial species inside the human gut. And the, um, the properties of the class one integron let it do this. It can sample diverse gene cassettes, which are then fixed if they confer a selective advantage. This particular transposon here is called a res hunter. It, the site for it to insert is the resolution site of plasmids. So automatically it starts finding lots of different plasmids and inserting this complex element into those. Once you get inserted into multiple different plasmids, you are then able to move between multiple different species of bacteria. And I think the most likely location for all of these diversification events is inside the human gut or in the gut of agricultural animals or probably both. Now, this mobile class one integron that I've just described is one of the most successful genetic elements of the 20th and 21st century. Remember, we think there was a single copy of this in the early 1900s. It's now acquired a total of 130 different re resistance genes. It's spread to all sorts of plasmids and bacterial pathogens. It's spread to every continent and it's universal in the microbiota of human and agricultural animals. And in general, we now all carry resistance genes and class one integrons in our microbiome. And the diversity of resistance that we carry in our gut microbiota um, increases as we age. This is children, school children, high school students and adults. And uh, we shed these back into the environment like um, Liz was talking about. We even shed them into our own homes. So this is um, a project I've been doing on vacuum cleaner dust. So you just take vacuum cleaner dust, you, you extract DNA and you screen it for class one integrons. And this gel here is actually the um, dust from my own lounge room. So, I mean, you might say, well, I work on integrons. It's pretty you know, likely that there's gonna be integrons in my house, but 95% of the vacuum cleaner dust samples that we test have class one integrons in them. And here's a back of the envelope calculation I did in um, 2017. We know how many copies of class one integrons are in feces. We know how many grams of feces are shed per day for pigs, chickens, cows, and humans. And we know how big those populations are. Here's the number of class one integron copies released every day. And you can see these are very big numbers, 10 to the 23, 10 to the 21. This is every single day. Now, that means that the environment is being flooded with these genetic elements. And this is a meta-analysis of a whole series of qPCR studies showing roughly the number of class one integrons in different uh, compartments, soil, farm manure. Now, this goes back to, to Liz's talk. You can look at wastewater, wastewater treatment sludge, effluent, rivers and lakes, and freshwater sediment. And you can see that this element, the class one integron together with its attendant resistance genes, actually survives sewage treatment very well and these numbers are enormous. 
So this element is now abundant wherever humans and their, and their domestic animals are found. And what this does, this vastly increased abundance of class one integrons, increases the likelihood of lateral transfer into environmental bacteria like Liz was talking about. It also increases the possibility of acquisition of resistance genes and resistant bacteria by wild animals. And of course, these elements are still active. So they're capable of acquiring novel gene cassettes and forming ever more complex, what I call xenogenetic DNA in parallel to xenobiotic compounds. These are d complex DNA elements that would never have formed but for the uh, attempts by humans to control bacterial growth. <clears throat> so with these huge quantities of class one integrons being shed into the environment, we have to start thinking about what are they going to do next? What kinds of cassettes can they access? And could those gene cassettes confer any phenotypes of concern? So this is what a gene cassette looks like. It's basically a promoterless open reading frame with a recombination site on either end. And the recombination site is slightly conserved, so you can use it as a handle for PCR. When you do that, and just do PCR to amplify unknown gene cassettes from environmental um, samples, you find that there's an enormous number of different, this is just a, just a standard electrophoresis gel of gene cassette PCR. Each one of these bands is a different gene cassette, and this, each of these tracks represents soil samples taken a meter apart from each other across a transect. So you can see enormous diversity here and enormous spatial variability. So we wanted to ask how spatially variable and how many gene cassettes are there? So we took a whole series of soil samples from the desert in Australia, from our campus, and also from Antarctic soils, did high throughput sequencing, when we did that, we recovered some more than 40,000 different gene cassettes with 27,000 unique proteins. And the numbers of gene cassettes per 0.3 grams of soil, which is, was our sample size, was 4,000 to 18,000 different cassettes per 0.3 grams of soil, depending on location. If you plot this out, um, each of the horizontal lines here is a different gene cassette. Each of the columns is a different um, sample. So what you can see, let's just take this one sample here. Most the, the most common gene cassettes in this particular sample are unique to this particular sample. And that's a pretty standard. So, so these are extraordinarily spatially diverse and they are unique often to an individual location. But look at the top here. There are some gene cassettes that are found in every single sample across Antarctica, the Australian desert and uh, the Macquarie campus. So we looked at those 600 cassettes that were found in every single sample. And cassettes, because they're so diverse and so weird, most of them you can't assign a function to. In fact, most of them have no um, homologue in the databases. But you can identify some of them. And amongst the ones that we could identify, there were some phenotypes, potential phenotypes of concern. Obviously, antibiotic resistance was one of the things that we found widely distributed. Beta-lactamase, N-acetyltransferases, uh, DFRs, bleomycin resistance, but there were some other things that were a bit concerning too. So virulence functions were found in cassettes, type two secretion systems, virulence factors, glycosyl transferases, and importantly, some cassettes actually look to encode phage resistance, CRISPR-Cas3 and methylase genes. So what that means is that if we start using phage therapy, there are gene cassettes out there that integrons are ready to capture to provide um, resistance to uh, phage therapy. So coming back, we need to consider the ecology and environment and evolutionary aspects when we're thinking about bacterial resistance, because for too long, uh, resistance has been a purely clinical phenomenon that's been investigated as a, as a phenomenon of the clinic with very little thought to how the environment interacts.
So our attempts to control bacterial growth have had all of these adverse consequences. Selection for resistance genes and potentially for virulence and transmission, selection for increased mobility of those genes via transposons and plasmids and moving on to um, into new species, uh, the assembly of these mosaic DNA elements, uh, the vast increases in the distribution and abundances of both resistance genes and the integrons that carry them. And, and that is actually a, a serious pollution problem. We're polluting the world with mobile DNAs and their host cells. And as a consequence, we're increasing the potential rates of bacterial evolution. So thanks for your attention. Uh, these are some of the people in my lab. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you all. Okay. Thank you, I'm Michael. Going. Very interesting. Very good. Um, we will open up the session for questions and discussions. So I want to bring back Connie and Elizabeth, if you also uh, get back on into the discussion. And again, please submit any uh, questions through the questions link. And we have uh, about 10, 15 minutes to go through these. Okay. Okay. So far, nothing has yet come in. I'm just checking here. I, I can't see anyone for some reason. Okay, no, there there are a few here. So, uh, okay, uh, this was about methods. Metagenomics with short reads does not allow to assemble plasmids. Why? Is this related to the sequencing method or the DNA isolation method? And I think. That's I, I, mean, I, take, I can take this to start with. So one of the problems with um, these mobile DNA elements is they often contain multiple copies of the same um, of the same genetic region and short reads, unless they're longer than the repeat that you're trying to assemble, can't reliably assemble. So what we've been doing and what Connie and Liz, I'm sure, have also been doing is a mixture of short read and long read technology, either using nanopore or pack bio and combining that with Illumina sequencing. And that, that allows you to assemble through complex regions that have multiple, um, multiple copies of particular elements. Indeed. Uh, so another, we, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to add, even if you do genome sequencing of uh, isolates, very often people are not able to assemble plasmids from uh, the short read uh, genome sequences. This is what occurred for our 120 E. coli strains. I would have loved to see the ink F plasmids, but this was impossible. So we have to realize that we do have to work on our sequencing technologies and the long reads are obviously one step to the solution. Are you seeing more uh, data now with the nanopore method, for example, to be doing this? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, we do all our metagenomes now with nanopore, so we can get up to 50 million reads on a nanopore flow cell, so it's super good and much cheaper than pack bio. So yeah, we're, we're using we're using nanopore as well. I think it's a it's a big uh, development for ecological research, definitely. Yeah. And 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 now that some of the problem of the um, error rate has been solved, yeah. or you can yeah. process the sequences process, to yeah. to remove the errors, uh, it's a lot better. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, we, we put on uh, bioarchives and many other pipelines for polishing and and correcting and so I think now there are many many pipelines out there that you can use to to achieve yeah. a good and, and of course if you have a combination of both so you have a, um, a an Illumina um, high seek and a long read 
then you mm. can you can compare the two and you get really nice assembly then because you mm. can yes. fill in the gaps on your on your nanopore with with your nice high c so it, it works really well in combination and and we've been finding that too liz that um so so particularly i mean um was it Liz or Connie that me mentioned IS-26 elements? And, mm. and they're everywhere, they're scattered through the genome. And and if your read length is shorter than an IS-26 element, which it almost certainly is, then mm. you have no way of telling what IS-26 is joined to what other piece of DNA. And you might have hundreds of them. So, mm. so that's that's... That's why you do need a long read yeah. technology to assemble these plasmids in particular. So related to then this, uh, and this is about the whole, the huge amount of integrase genes that are coming out for, through fecal matter. Is it possible to differentiate the sources of integrase genes from human versus animals? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the problem with the integrase gene is that it's essentially a single gene copy that has expanded. And so the, the sequences are 99, 98% identical for all of the clinical isolates. And so um, you can't really, you can't really distinguish um, whether it's animal or, or, or human. I think what, what you have to do is use the long read to look at flanking regions to yes. then see where, where the where the integron is. So you, you establish if it's in a human associated bacterium or or a animal associated, and that, that will give you your answer. But you can't do that from the integron because as as Michael has already pointed out, these are spread everywhere. And you know, the one we found in the soil in the arthrobacter all those years ago is identical to ones you, you find in salmonella in feces now. So, yeah. uh, and that was in pig manure. So that was, that was in a, in a soil. So, you, you know, I think the, the important thing is finding out where the location is, where, where are they located? Where are these mobile elements and what, what's happening? Why are they, why are they located where they are? I think, you know, as, as Michael pointed out, what is driving, their acquisition and maintenance, because you would think they would cause some fitness costs, but that's the other thing that I, that I think now is clear, is that fitness is, is offset by many other things. So uh, although these integrons are, are constitutively expressed, the genes, it's there seem to have other genes that offset this uh, impact. Yeah, and plasmids maybe. Connie's going to tell us about this. Uh, no, I wanted to add uh, because the integrons belong to the few uh, targets which we detected in community DNA without any enrichment. This, uh -huh. They were there quite abundant. So for QPCRs, it's uh, the abundance which matters whether you will be able to detect. So you need yeah. to have 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5th target sequences. Otherwise, uh, you don't get the signal. Uh, but I wanted to ask Michael something about a study. Unfortunately, I do not recall the name of the first author of the study, but um, they reported about class one integron from permafrost, which carried also resistant genes. So what would you comment about this? This was from Russia, this I remember. Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay. did they contaminate or was it a real thing? So there's a couple of, without meaning to criticize these authors, they were isolating bacteria from permafrost and yeah. then screening. And the sequences of those integrons are identical to uh, clinical integrons and the permafrost itself from memory was 50,000 years old. So mm. ask yourself what is the chance that that particular sequence has not changed by one nucleotide since 50,000 years ago and okay. the answer is there's zero chance. 
and mm -hmm. that is a modern contaminant that they that that they have characterized. Okay. And I mean, it's, so it, it was, was a, more it was my a, gut feeling, but <laughs> it was a it was a pseudomonas, and it was a modern contaminant with a classical clinical class one integron in it that you would find in any hospital anywhere that is carried by every single one of those researchers in their gut. So, you know, okay. extraordinary okay. claims require extraordinary proof, right? Okay. <laughs> okay. There's uh, one more question for actually the whole group. The natural presence of microbiome in nature is directed by the actual pollution, which is present for many years. These pollutants will not decrease in the short term. What strategy must the industry follow and society, or the, must we follow in industry and society to change this situation? How to decrease the increase in resistance strains in the natural environment? <clears throat> Any ideas? I mean, how do we use all of this information now to improve the situation? Maybe oh, I, I would like to start. So I, I recently read a lot of papers on the intrinsic microbiome uh, resistome. I think this is something where all our metagenome analysis also have a problem because we are detecting everything. We cannot distinguish between those genes which were really acquired because of the human use of antibiotics. So I believe uh, the most important thing is, first of all, to reduce pollutant uh, concentration and we have to handle our waste differently. So we have to realize what we put on our soils or what we use for irrigation. So uh, these are the two aspects. And I would still think that a uh, large number of the resistant genes detected by metagenomes are intrinsic. But of course, when we apply selective pressure, we are also changing the bacteria which are out there and uh, which ha are intrinsically resistant because they have these different phenotypes like uh, biofilm swarming and persister cells or they have uh, efflux pumps or they have porines. So there are lots of mechanisms. But of course, we are changing the relative abundance, which might lead to differences in functions of our soils, for instance, or the plant microbiome. So it's so, polluted. Um, so my, my answer to this would be similar to Connie's, but the first thing is knowing the problem. So, it was 2006 that Amy Pruden first published her paper saying, hey guys, antibiotic resistance genes in the environment are an emerging pollutant. That's not that long ago, that's 14 years ago. And so now we've got lots of people interested in how many of these genes are flowing through human ecosystems. We also have lots of people who are really interested in detecting the kinds of pharmaceuticals, chemicals, disinfectants, heavy metals that humans use all the time, and we're able to detect them at quite low concentrations. So it's those two things that we need to keep control of. One of the things that we could do without seriously rewiring or re-piping all of our sewage systems is to separate urine streams from fecal streams because many of these compounds are excreted preferentially in urine. And if you can, if you can <clears throat> separate yeah. that out, then, then you remove a lot of the antibiotics from this stream. When you remove the selective pressure, you then change the dynamics of the decay of these, of these elements in the environment. Um, but that still doesn't solve heavy metals, um, disinfectants, um, caffeine, ibuprofen, estrogen. Um, uh, you, the, if you if you look at any of the, so that it, at the University of Queensland, they routinely test sewage for all sorts of pharmaceuticals and illicit drugs, and they're able to pinpoint places where methamphetamine use is really high simply by looking at sewage. 
and they're able to pinpoint meth labs as well. So, and you'll see recently people are testing coronavirus in sewage. Mm -hmm. So you can get an idea of how many people are infected in a catchment. So, so the, these. Yeah, that's a very important point because one thing that probably will be instrumental in change is is COVID, because uh, some some research has shown that that COVID can that the SARS-CoV-2 can survive wastewater treatment plants and yeah. they and be infectious. So if we are polluting our rivers with SARS-CoV-2, that's a very serious situation. And we need to then be much more clear about how we're going to treat our waste, whether it be urine or feces. And both have to be treated. And I totally agree with you that that we I think you, that if you start to allow more diversity to develop, you reduce selection, you will definitely see an improvement in the situation. We yeah, have and to the other thing to start doing something now, definitely. And and the other thing that we really need to know is the minimum effective concentration of all of these agents. Because the concentrations that we use agents at, which are bactericidal or bacteriostatic, these yeah. compounds still have activities at hundreds of the dose that we might use yeah. in vivo. And, and we know nothing about their half-lives or their um, effects at really low concentrations. And we need to know that so that we can get to the um, no effect concentration. Yeah. Or at least balance some kind of concentration with the economy of removing or preventing this stuff from getting into river systems. Because water systems connect everything. They connect all of our terrestrial ecosystems with the marine ecosystem, and they're they're essential for us and and you know yeah. we we treat them as a sewer and it's and it's not yeah. smart yeah, yeah no I, I really appreciated elizabeth your note of a river of waste yeah mm -hmm. which Indeed is important yeah so and, uh, i think we can take one final question to wrap it up and that's actually a very timely one any thoughts on the COVID-19 pandemic and antimicrobial resistance? So this was already a <laughs> Yeah, we, I mean, we use it as, as a lever to, to make the water utility companies clean up their act. I mean, in Scandinavia now, it's completely forbidden to allow any viable organisms to, to uh, come out of effluent. It has to be treated either by ozone or by UV or some other method um, so that you don't release anything from wastewater and you have to treat the biosolids as well they have to be treated because they get put onto land as i showed and connie showed and they use this fertilizer and so they can get straight back into the food chain so you know pandemics are not going to go away they are they are a fact of life they're a fact of climate change they are a fact of the way we are in encroaching on on wildlife habitats mm. and we have to be much more responsible about our waste products and how we how we recycle them i think this is going to be a really important lesson now mm. and if a so, water company can give a golden hello of 2.5 million to its co then they can afford to do something with the shit that comes out of the pipes at the other end <laughs> So, so the, 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 other thing, the other thing that I would say is that this is an opportunity to educate more generally about microorganisms. I mean, we, we kind of, humans kind of think that they're the top dog on the planet, and actually they're not, as has been seen, right? Entire economies, our entire way of life, has been brought down by a thing that's not even alive. It's not it's not an independent organism. And it started as a single particle, a single infection in a single person. And then it spread. So so this offers us an opportunity to to say to the general public, these things are important. You need to know about them. 
and you need to change the way you think about humans and their interaction with the natural world just like liz is saying you know we are part of the natural world and we need to remember that because the natural world can bite back i'm surprised that it hasn't done so more deeply already um, but this is the first example well actually it's not the first example because we escaped from SARS and MERS and Zika and Lyssa virus and Nipah virus and you know all of these things that almost became pandemics but as Liz says these things are going to happen again and again and again. So indeed Louis Pasteur was right the microbes will have the last world. Yes. We will definitely continue talking uh, and so I want to, we're going to continue with the webinar series uh, every month, so please uh, stay tuned as we send new announcements on the topics coming next. And I really want to first thank Michael, Elizabeth, Connie, uh, wonderful talks, thanks for taking the time to uh, speak today. And I want to thank everybody who's tuned in. We've had uh, uh, about 250 people from all over the world coming in. So it's actually a wonderful way for us to reach out across in this time as well. And we'll continue to do this. So there are more, more topics that we'll cover uh, in the FEMS Microbiology Ecology webinar series as we go into September. So with that, wishing you all the best. Take care, everyone. and. We will see each other soon in one place, hopefully. Good night, oh, Mike. <laughs> yeah, good night. Thank you. It's um, <laughs> it's one forty-five here. That's sad. Well, so thank I you for staying. To now to the train station. So that's yes. right. Bye bye. Okay. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye now.